Okay, so hi everybody, welcome back. Today we're gonna to be starting a new chapter. That's chapter 17 of the textbook. And actually, we're really just focusing on the first four sections in that chapter. So the topic that's covered here is thermal expansion. Now this is gonna be a relatively short lecture. In fact, uh, we'll finish everything in just this one video. So let's get into it. So we'll start with temperature scales. Thermal expansion is an effect that depends on temperature. So we need to understand how to measure temperature and the different scales that are used to measure temperature. Let's start by trying to get an understanding of what temperature is in physics terms. Now, our experience of temperature is pretty simple. If you touch an object and it feels hot, it has a high temperature. If it feels cold when you touch it, it has a lower temperature. But what is actually going on inside the object that makes it feel hot or cold when you touch it? That's what we want to understand. So it turns out this is just a result of random molecular motions within the object. So this is an animation uh, at the bottom of the slide showing you what it would look like if we could zoom in on a glass of water and look at the individual water molecules as they move around. So they're in constant random motion, they're bumping into each other, they're exchanging energy, and overall it's a very complicated picture. Each molecule is moving at a different speed, each molecule has a different kinetic energy, and it's constantly changing because they're bumping into each other. But what we can say is there's an average kinetic energy of these molecules. Okay, so even though each molecule has a different kinetic energy, there is some sort of average that we could talk about as far as the collection of molecules. Now, the idea behind temperature is, temperature is just telling you something about the average kinetic energy of those molecules. It's directly proportional to that average kinetic energy. So the higher the temperature an object has, the faster its molecules are moving. Okay, the higher the kinetic energy of those molecules. And at the same time, the lower the temperature of the object, that's just indicating that there's less motion on this molecular level, the, the lower the kinetic energy is on average. Okay, so we can actually imagine um, lowering the kinetic energy continually, slowing the molecules down, which lowers the temperature. And at some point, you reach a minimum, right? There's some kind of minimum kinetic energy that these uh, molecules can have that you can't go any lower than. And when you do that, you reach a temperature which we call absolute zero. So absolute zero is the lowest physically possible temperature because at that point, the molecular motion reaches a minimum and it can't go any lower than that. Okay, so that's what temperature is in physics terms. Now, how do we measure temperature? We need some kind of temperature scale. So there are different temperature scales out there, like the Celsius and the Fahrenheit scale, uh, and there are others too. But we construct the scale by first assigning values to two easily reproducible temperatures. So we want two temperatures that we can easily reproduce in a lab setting. So typically, this would be the boiling point and the freezing point of water. That's the two temperatures we would use. And then in between those two temperatures, we would divide the scale into evenly spaced increments. So let me give you an example of what this looks like in the Fahrenheit scale. So the Fahrenheit scale is what we're used to in the United States to measure the temperature outside to see what the weather's like. In that scale, the freezing point of water is 32 degrees Fahrenheit and the boiling point of water is 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So in between the freezing point and the boiling point of water, we have 180 degrees Fahrenheit in between. Now the Celsius scale is what's used in most of the rest of the world. And the freezing point of water is zero degrees Celsius and the boiling point is 100 degrees Celsius. So there's 100 degrees Celsius in between uh, those two temperatures. 
So this is a visual representation of the two temperature scales. On the left-hand side, we have Celsius. On the right-hand side, we have Fahrenheit. So this red line represents the boiling point. This blue line represents the freezing point. And again, we have zero Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit for the freezing point of water. For the boiling point, we have 100 Celsius or 212 degrees Fahrenheit for the boiling point of water. That's how we construct these two temperature scales. Okay, so in addition to the Celsius and the Fahrenheit scales for temperature, we also have the Kelvin scale. Now to explain how the Kelvin scale works, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a historical background. So we'll start with Charles Law. So Charles Law relates the volume and the temperature of a gas at a fixed pressure. So here's what you should be imagining. We have a container of gas, it's sealed in a piston, and we can put weights on the piston to control the pressure, to make sure that whatever happens, the pressure stays the same. Of course, the amount of gas is also staying the same because none of it's leaking out and no new gas is coming in. So what we can do is heat the gas up, uh, put a flame underneath it to increase its temperature, and since the piston is movable, that can also lead to a change in the volume. So here's what we see according to Charles Law. If the temperature increases, so does the volume. So the higher the temperature of the gas, the more it will push out on the piston and expand the volume. Okay, the lower the temperature, the lower the volume. And there's actually just a direct proportionality between those two. So if we plot temperature versus volume like this, we'll find that it just forms a straight line. There's just a linear relationship or a direct proportionality between those two variables. So if we have some real data where we keep the pressure fixed and we see how the volume changes with the temperature of a gas, we can plot out some data points. Here we have volume on the vertical axis, temperature on the horizontal. And again, those data points form a straight line. That's what Charles Law says. So these are the points we actually measured, but of course we can extrapolate that by just following the line backwards over here. And we can see that as we follow the line backwards to smaller and smaller temperatures, we're also getting smaller and smaller volumes. Now at some point, if we follow the line back far enough, the volume actually goes to zero. And at the point where the volume goes to zero, we see the temperature is minus 273 degrees Celsius. So here's the thing. The volume can't get smaller than zero. You can't have a negative volume of gas. So this should also be the smallest possible temperature we can have for our gas, which again is minus 273 degrees Celsius. Now, if you repeat this experiment using different types of gas, like you can do it for hydrogen gas, you can do it for helium gas, it doesn't matter. And you can even use any pressure you want. Every single time you do this, if you extrapolate the line back, you see that we go to zero volume at this temperature. So that's really strong evidence that this is the lowest possible temperature, minus 273 degrees Celsius. And so that's what we call absolute zero. You can't go lower in temperature than this. So that's where the Kelvin scale comes in. The Kelvin scale has the same divisions as Celsius, right? So there's still 100 uh, increments between the freezing point and the boiling point of water, except we set the zero point of our scale to be absolute zero. You see, the Celsius scale can go negative, and the Fahrenheit scale, the temperatures can go negative. But in the Kelvin scale, temperatures can't go negative when we say zero Kelvin, we're talking about absolute zero. That's the lowest point you can get. And then everything above that is some sort of positive temperature in the Kelvin scale. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how to convert between temperature scales. Okay, so... If we want to go from degrees Celsius to Kelvin, all you have to do is add 273. The only difference between the Celsius scale 
in the Kelvin scale is where we set the zero point. So temperature in Kelvin is equal to the temperature in degrees Celsius plus 273. Okay, what about if we want to go between um, Fahrenheit and Celsius? In other words, what if I have the temperature in degrees Celsius and I want it in degrees Fahrenheit? Okay, so we'll think about how this works. Remember, the freezing point of water, of H2O, is zero degrees in the Celsius scale, but 32 degrees in the Fahrenheit scale. The boiling point of water that's 100 degrees in the Celsius scale and 212 degrees in the Fahrenheit scale. So if we look at the temperature difference between boiling and freezing in Fahrenheit and the temperature difference between boiling and freezing in Celsius scales, well, for Fahrenheit, we have 212 minus 32. That's the range of temperatures. In Celsius, we have 100 minus 0. Okay? 212 minus 32 is 180. And 100 minus 0 is 100. 180 over 100 can be reduced to just 9 over 5. Okay, so here's how we convert between Celsius and Fahrenheit. The temperature in degrees Fahrenheit is 9 over 5 times the te temperature in degrees Celsius because, again, the increments are different by a factor of 9 over 5. But then we also have to add 32 because the zero point of the Fahrenheit scale is 32 degrees above where it is in Celsius. Okay, so... Let's put a box around that. This is how we go from uh, Celsius to Kelvin. This is how we go from Celsius to Fahrenheit. And so this is how we convert between the different temperature scales. If we want to go from Celsius to Fahrenheit, the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit would be 9 fifths times the temperature in degrees Celsius plus 32. We can actually just flip this around to solve for the temperature in degrees Celsius to go the other way from Fahrenheit to Celsius. So just doing that, we have the temperature in degrees Celsius equals five over nine times the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit minus 32 in parentheses. Okay, going from Celsius to Kelvin, that's just a matter of adding 273. So temperature in degrees Celsius plus 273 is the temperature in Kelvin. Going the other way, you subtract the 273. So if we're going from Kelvin to Celsius, temperature in degrees Celsius is the temperature in Kelvin minus 273. So that's everything we need to know just to convert between the temperature scales. Okay, so with that said, let's get a little practice with the conversions. Normal human body temperature is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. What would that temperature be on the Celsius scale in degrees Celsius? And another question, at what temperature do the Celsius and the Fahrenheit scales give you the same reading? So there's some temperature where Celsius and Fahrenheit are actually the same. You're gonna actually find that temperature. So pause the video, try to work these two out, and then come back to it when you have your answers. So we'll start with normal human body temperature. So we want this in degrees Celsius. So we'll use the conversion that the temperature in degrees Celsius is 5 over 9 times the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit minus 32. So here we have 5 over 9 times 98.6 minus 32. If you crunch those numbers, you'll get 37, let me write it down here, 37.0 degrees Celsius. Okay, so that's equivalent to 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so for the next question, 
let's let x represent the temperature where the two scales give the same reading. So let x be the temperature where uh, the Celsius and the Fahrenheit scales, this one is a hard word to spell, Fahrenheit scales give the same reading. Okay, so we can use the conversion that the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit is equal to 9 over 5 times the temperature in degrees Celsius. Um, sorry, 9 over 5 times the temperature in degrees Celsius plus 32. We could also use this conversion, by the way. It doesn't matter, but I'm just going to use this one for the solution. And so, well, for the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit, that's just X, right? So that's equal to 9 over 5. Here we have the temperature in degrees Celsius. Well, that's also X because we're looking for a value where these two scales are the same. And then plus 32. So really it comes down to solving this algebraic equation. So subtract 9 fifths from both sides. And then that will give us negative 4 fifths times x equaling 32. So x should be equal to negative 5 times 32 over 4. 32 divided by, <coughs> excuse me, 32 divided by 4 is 8. So we have minus 5 times 8, which is minus 40. So what I'm saying is negative 40 degrees Celsius is the same as negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the only temperature where the two scales match. No other temperature works. Okay, so next, let's talk about thermometers. How do we actually build a device that's capable of measuring temperature? Well, the short answer is any physical characteristic that changes with temperature can be used to construct a thermometer. So I'm gonna show you two examples. Um, and both of these thermometers rely on a phenomenon called thermal expansion. And that's the main topic of this lecture. Thermal expansion refers to the idea that if you heat a substance up, it tends to expand, it tends to increase in volume. And if a substance cools down, it tends to decrease in volume, it tends to contract. So we can actually use that increase and decrease in volume to measure an increase and a decrease in temperature because they go hand in hand. So one example would be a mercury thermometer. So this is just a glass tube filled with mercury. If we heat the mercury up, it expands, it increases in volume, which means the top layer of mercury up here will rise, it will go up. So if we keep track of the mercury level in the tube, that's rising as the temperature is rising. If the temperature drops, then that mercury level also drops because the volume has contracted. So if we put markings along the tube that indicate different temperatures, we can actually just read off the temperature directly from the tube. Here's another example, and it also relies on thermal expansion. This is called a bimetallic strip thermometer. So the idea is we have two thin strips of metal and they're different types of metal. So maybe this is copper and this is steel, something like that. So the two strips of metal will expand if heated up, but one of them expands even more than the other, okay? Because they're made of two different materials, one of them is more susceptible to expansion than the other. So if the strips are perfectly straight like this, if we heat them up, then this one expands more than the other, okay? Which means the strip is going to bend, okay? And the higher the temperature, the more the strip is going to bend. So you can measure the temperature just by measuring the amount that the strip is bending. Okay, so in both of these cases, we're using some sort of physical characteristic of the metal or the mercury 
to measure the temperature. Now, a digital thermometer works on a slightly different principle. It turns out electrical resistance can change with temperature, and that's how most digital thermometers work, um, but that's another story. And so without any further delay, let's get into thermal expansion. So again, as I mentioned before, most materials are going to expand to a larger size when they are heated up. And then at the same time, they'll contract to a smaller size when they're cooled down. We call this effect thermal expansion. So what we wanna do is develop some equations that describe how thermal expansion works. So everything we're gonna develop in these equations is just a result of experiment, okay? So why does it work this way? It's because if you study thermal expansion in a lab experimentally, this is what fits the data. So experimentally, for small amounts of thermal expansion, the change in an object size, which we'll call delta L, is proportional to two things. One, its original size, and two, its change in temperature. So the change in size is proportional to the original size and also the change in temperature. Again, these results are only gonna be valid as long as we're talking about small amounts of expansion. So what we mean by that specifically is the change in size that's happening, delta L, is a lot, lot smaller than the actual original size, L0. So as long as that's the case, here's what we have. Delta L, a change in size, is proportional to L0 times delta T. All right, that's what we have. So next, let's write this as a full-fledged equation rather than saying something is proportional to something else. So the thermal expansion of an object in one dimension, so we're talking about the expansion of an object's length is described by this equation. Delta L is our change in length. Alpha is that constant of proportionality in the equation, which is called the coefficient of linear expansion. So this is just gonna be a constant that depends on what material we're using. L naught again is the initial length and delta T is the change in temperature. So here's the picture you should have in your mind. If we start off at some initial temperature, which we'll call T0, the object has a length, L0, right? But then if we heat the object up to a final temperature, which we'll just call T, thermal expansion dictates that the object is now a little bit longer. So the final length is L. So there's a change in length that happened, uh, which is delta L. That's the difference between final and initial, L minus L naught. Delta L is what we're calculating in this equation, the change in length. And again, it's gonna be small compared to the actual size of the thing. So the last thing to say is that we have a change in temperature, delta T, which also is a final minus initial sort of thing. So T is our final temperature. T0 is our initial, delta T is T minus T0, okay? So that's how the equation works. So in that equation, again, we have a constant. We give it the Greek letter alpha, and it's called the coefficient of linear expansion. So again, that's the constant of proportionality in our equation. Delta L equals alpha times L naught times delta T. And basically, what this tells you is how easily is a length of a material going to be changed when its temperature changes. If alpha is very big, you get a lot of thermal expansion for that particular material. If alpha is really small, you don't get a lot of thermal expansion for that particular material. So what you're going to be doing in the homework oftentimes is looking up in a table the coefficient of thermal expansion for a particular material. So these aren't things you need to memorize, just if you need to refer to them, in the textbook, there's a table, a lot like this, of different uh, coefficients of thermal expansion. So just to pull out a few, we have aluminum, 
that's 25 times 10 to the minus 6. The units of alpha are actually inverse degrees Celsius. For brass, it's 19 times 10 to the minus 6. Again, inverse degrees Celsius. If you ever need to refer to these values, just go to the table. And let's take a bit of a closer look at the units for alpha. So delta L equals alpha times L0 times delta T. Let's rearrange that to solve for alpha. That would be delta L over L0 times delta T. Now, what sort of units would go in uh, in the SI system for each one of these quantities? Well, for delta L, that's a change in length, so it'd be measured in meters. L0 is our original length, so that would be also measured in meters. And then a temperature change in the SI system would be measured in degrees Celsius. So actually what we have here is just one over degrees Celsius or degrees Celsius to the minus one. That's the unit for alpha. The other thing to note about this is that we always assume small changes. Small changes in size in particular, which means delta L is much, much less than L0, right? So we can write this in a different way. Delta L divided by L0 is much, much less than 1. Okay, well, let's take our equation down here and divide out L0. So we have delta L over L0. That's equal to alpha times delta T. So what we're saying is this is a really small number, much less than 1. That means this is also a very small number, much less than 1. So alpha times delta t is always going to be a lot less than 1. And we can always assume this whenever we make a calculation. Okay, So that's going to come up later. OK, so let's do an example. The steel bed of a suspension bridge is 200 meters long when its temperature is 20 degrees Celsius. But throughout the year, the bridge is expected to be exposed to temperatures as low as minus 30 degrees Celsius and as high as positive 40 degrees Celsius. So based on that, by what amount will the length vary throughout the year? In order to do the calculation here, we need to know the coefficient of linear expansion for steel. That's 12 times 10 to the minus 6 uh, inverse degrees Celsius. Okay, so what we're calculating here is by what amount is the length going to change throughout the year because of thermal expansion. So let's work it out. Okay, so first, let's find the change of length of the bridge on the hottest day of the year. So here's what we know. On the hottest day of the year, the temperature is positive 40 degrees Celsius. We also know that the initial length of the bridge is 200 meters when the temperature is positive 20 degrees Celsius. So based on that, we can calculate a change in length using the formula delta L equals alpha times L naught times delta T. So here's what we have. Alpha is 12 times 10 to the minus 6 inverse degrees Celsius for steel. L0 is 200 meters. And then the temperature change would be 40 degrees Celsius for final minus 20 degrees Celsius for initial. Now, take note of how the units work out. We have uh, degrees Celsius over here and then inverse degrees Celsius over here. So those will just cancel, leaving us with just meters. So we have 0 0.048 meters is what that works out to, or about 4.8 centimeters. Okay, so the, the bridge actually gets longer by 4.8 centimeters on the hottest day of the year compared to this value. Now, on the coldest day of the year,
our temperature is minus 30 degrees Celsius. So delta L in that case is going to be alpha, which is 12 times 10 to the minus 6 inverse degrees Celsius times L naught, 200 meters. Now our change in temperature is final, which is negative 30 degrees Celsius minus initial, which is 20 degrees Celsius. This works out to minus 0 0.12 meters. Okay, and that's minus 12 centimeters. So on the hottest day, we have an increase in length. On the coldest day, we have a decrease. So throughout the year, what sort of change are we looking at? How many centimeters is the length actually varying? Well, it would just be the 4.8 centimeters on the high side plus the 12 centimeters on the low side, 16.8. Uh, we'd round that to about 17. Okay, so throughout the year, the length of the bridge is going to change by 17 centimeters. And that's something you have to account for when you're designing the bridge, the fact that it is going to change in length uh, by this range. And so this is why many large structures are outfitted with expansion joints. So this is an example of an expansion joint. If you're in a really large parking structure, you can try to find these. You'll probably see them uh, scattered throughout the structure. And the basic idea is, if you have a big structure, you'll often wanna construct it in segments. So not one continuous piece, but different segments, which are connected by these expansion joints. This ensures that the structure actually has room to expand and contract as the temperature changes, and that prevents it from fracturing, prevents it from cracking and breaking in certain places. Okay, so next time uh, you go to a big parking garage, see if you can locate the expansion joints. Okay, so everything we've talked about so far deals with an expansion of length. So it's a one-dimensional expansion something's length is changing. But of course, if you have a two-dimensional object, like a sheet of metal, let's say, its area is going to expand. So how do we deal with the thermal expansion of area? So to derive the formula, we're going to consider a rectangle that has dimensions L naught by W naught. And this is when the temperature is at its initial value, T naught. So of course, there's a certain area here, right? We'll call that A naught. But if we heat this up to a final temperature, the width and the length are both going to expand. So it's gonna expand along each dimension. We're gonna have a new length and we're gonna have a new width, which means we'll have a new area when we reach this final temperature. So I want to develop an equation that tells us how much has the area changed. In other words, what is delta A? Well, by definition, delta A is the final area, A, minus the initial area, A naught. But what I'll show you is that change in area is approximately equal to two times alpha times A naught times delta T. Okay, so let's see where this comes from. Okay, so first, the change in the length is going to be given by delta L equals alpha times L naught times delta T. So we already know that. But remember, delta L is just final minus initial. So we'll write this as final length L minus initial length L naught. That equals alpha times L naught times delta T. So if I solve for L, that's L naught plus alpha times L naught times delta T, or if we pull out the common factor of L naught, then we have L naught times one plus alpha delta T. So that's a way of solving for the final length. 
Now, in a similar way, there's a change in the width, delta w. Well, that's going to be alpha times w naught times delta t. So it expands along each dimension. And so by the same exact logic, we don't have to go through it all over again, the final width, w, is going to equal w naught times 1 plus alpha delta t, right? Okay, so the area, I should say the final area, is going to be given by a, which would just be the final length l times the final width w, but that would just be l naught 1 plus alpha delta t times w naught 1 plus alpha delta t. Let's write this in a more compact way. We have l naught times w naught, and then we have 1 plus alpha delta t squared. We have two factors of that. Okay, well, the initial area would just be a naught, and that's equal to l naught times w naught, the initial length times the initial width. So actually, what we have out front is the initial area, a naught. And that's multiplying 1 plus alpha times delta t squared. So actually, let's expand that out. We'll have 1 plus 2 times alpha delta t plus alpha times delta t squared. Okay, that's how we expand that out. But here's the thing. I showed you earlier that alpha times delta t is a really small number. It's much, much less than 1. It's always going to be true. So you see this last term here, alpha times delta t squared, is going to be a very small number. Because if you take a small number and then you square it, you get something even smaller. And we're actually going to assume it's so small that we can just neglect it. So now we're making an approximation by neglecting that last term that the final area A is equal to the initial area A0 plus 2 alpha times a naught times delta t. And ignore the last term. Okay, well, delta a, the change in area, that would just be a minus a naught, final minus initial, right? In other words, just move this over here, and now you have delta a. So that would just leave us with 2 times alpha times a naught times delta t. That's where the formula for the change in area comes from. And it doesn't have to be a rectangular area. It can actually be any shape, and this equation will still work. So here's an example that I'd like you to try to work out. At 20 degrees Celsius, the dimensions of an aluminum plate are 2.35 meters by 1.65 meters. The plate is inside of a frame, which has dimensions 2.38 meters by 1.67 meters. Okay, so here's the aluminum plate. Here's the frame. At this temperature, the aluminum plate is smaller than the frame. So if we ignore the expansion of the frame, let's assume that the frame stays the same, doesn't expand. What temperature would we have to heat up this aluminum plate to so that it completely fills the frame? So we want to heat it up so that it expands and then completely fills the frame. What would that temperature have to be to get this to work? So a few things we need to know. Of course, the dimensions are all given here. Uh, the initial temperature is 20 degrees Celsius. You want to find the final. You also need to know the coefficient of thermal expansion alpha for aluminum is 2.5 times 10 to the minus, uh, sorry, 25 times 10 to the minus 6 um, inverse degrees Celsius. So try to work this out. Pause the video for a sec and then come back to it. Okay, so we'll start with our formula for area expansion, which is delta A equals 
2 times alpha times a naught times delta t. And another way of writing that, delta a is a minus a naught, so final minus initial area. That equals 2 times alpha times a naught times delta t. So if we solve for the temperature, we have delta t equaling a minus a naught divided by 2 times alpha times a naught, like this. But delta t is a change in temperature. It's not the temperature we're looking for, it's the change. So we want to write this as t minus t naught, so final minus initial temperature. That equals a minus a naught over 2 times alpha a naught. And then we'll just move the minus uh, t naught to the other side. So we have t equals t naught plus a minus a naught over 2 times alpha times a naught. Okay? So that's something we can directly calculate. So the final temperature is going to be this. T equals T naught, that's our initial temperature, 20 degrees Celsius, plus, okay, we have A, that's the final area. So here, we should be using the area of the frame that the aluminum plate is going to fill out. So that frame has dimensions 2.38 meters by 1.67 meters, so if we multiply the two, we get the area, minus A naught. Well, that would be the initial area of the aluminum plate, which had dimensions 2.35 meters by 1.65 meters. So multiply those to get the initial area. And then we're dividing that all by 2 times 25.0, 10 to the minus 6 degrees Celsius. And that's multiplying A naught once again. So that's 2.35 meters times 1.65 meters. So this temperature comes out in degrees Celsius to be 520.8 or about 521 degrees Celsius. So you'd, you'd have to heat the aluminum plate to that temperature to get it to expand and then fully uh, fill out the frame. And so you can probably guess what's coming next thermal expansion of volume. So let's consider a three-dimensional object such as this rectangular prism shown here. So the dimensions are L naught on this side, W naught on this side, and then H naught as the height. So those are the dimensions when the temperature is T naught. And of course it has a certain volume at that temperature. We'll call that V naught. But if we heat the uh, object up to a final temperature T, it will expand. And it's going to expand along every single dimension. So L is going to expand, W is going to expand, and H is also going to expand. We have the new length, the new width, and the new height at this new temperature. So the volume is something else. We have a final volume V at this temperature. We want an equation that tells us how much has the volume changed. So as we're gonna find out, delta V, that change in volume we're looking for, which would be final minus initial, V minus V naught, can be approximated in this way. It's approximately equal to three times alpha times V naught times delta T. Okay, so let me show you where that comes from. Okay, so first we'll note that each side changes in length and it's according to delta L equals alpha times L naught times delta T. Okay, that's the linear expansion of each side length. Now, delta L is L minus L naught. So that's equal to alpha times L naught times delta T. And if I solve for L, the final length, that would be L naught plus 
alpha times L naught times delta T, or pulling out the common factor of L naught, that's multiplying one time, or sorry, one plus alpha times delta T, okay? So this would be our final length. Now, for the width and the height, it works the same way. Right, we have the final width, w equaling w naught times 1 plus alpha delta t. And we have h equaling h naught times 1 plus alpha delta t. Right, It works the same way for length, width, and height. Now, if we want the final volume, well, that's going to be given by length times width times height. Okay, so for the length, we have L naught times one plus alpha delta T. For the width, we have W naught times one plus alpha delta T. And then we have H naught one plus alpha delta T for the height. So we can write this in a more compact way as L naught times w naught times h naught times 1 plus alpha delta t to the third power. So we're cubing that thing now. We have three factors of it. So the initial volume is actually in this formula, right? Because v naught, initial volume would be l naught times h naught. Uh, let me write that again. So the initial volume would be V naught equals L naught times W naught times H naught, right? Length, width, height for the initial measurements. So we can actually replace that here with V naught. So the final volume is the initial volume times, again, one plus alpha delta T all to the third power. So let's expand that out. If, we, if I have 1 plus alpha delta t to the third power, that's going to be 1 to the third power plus 3 times 1 to the second power times alpha delta t to the first power, and then plus 3 times 1 to the first power times alpha delta t to the second power, and then plus alpha delta t to the third power. Just let me write that again. Plus alpha delta t to the third power, right? That's how you expand this thing out. But just like before, alpha times delta t is going to be a small number, much, much less than one. Which means if I have that tiny number squared, or cubed, that's going to be a very small number. And we'll neglect them. So they're so small, they can just be neglected. So approximately, the final volume, V, is equal to V naught times 1 cubed, which is just 1, and then plus we have 3 times alpha times v naught times delta t from this term. Okay? So the change in volume delta v, which would be v minus v naught, like I said earlier, just put the v naught over there, and we're left with 3 times alpha times v naught times delta t. And again, this is an approximation, but it works really well because we're talking about very small changes in volume. Okay, so up until this point, we've learned about linear area and volume expansion. So let's summarize all of the results that we have so far. So changes in length, okay, one dimensional changes in length are given by delta L equals alpha times L naught times delta T this constant alpha is the coefficient of linear expansion. So when we deal with changes in area, 
Delta A is equal to two times alpha times A naught times delta T. This is a bit of an approximation, but notice there's just a factor of two difference between the constant out front here when we were dealing with area and out here when we're dealing with linear expansion. So what we say is the coefficient of area expansion is just double that, two times that of linear expansion. Now, when it comes to changes in volume, we found that delta V is equal to three times alpha times V naught times delta T. So again, it's the same form of the equation, but now the coefficient out front is three times alpha. So this is what we call the coefficient of volume expansion. That's three times the coefficient of linear expansion. It's three times alpha. So sometimes we'll denote the coefficient of volume expansion with the variable beta. So in other words, I could also write this as delta V is equal to beta times V naught times delta T, where beta is three times alpha. So sometimes you'll see it written this way, just to let you know. Okay, so that's what we have. Now let's do an example. A steel sphere is heated from an initial temperature of zero degrees Celsius to a final temperature of 100 degrees Celsius. By what percentage does its radius increase? Then, by what percentage does its volume increase? And then finally, by what percentage does its density decrease? So, in order to answer these questions and make the calculations, we need to know the coefficient of linear expansion or the alpha constant for steel. So for steel, that's going to be 12 times 10 to the minus 6 inverse degrees Celsius. Okay, so let's work it out. Okay, so for the radius, we're going to use the formula for linear expansion. So we're talking about a distance, not an area, not a volume. We use the formula for linear expansion in this case. Now, typically we'd use L to denote the length, but let's just use R because we're talking about a radius. So delta R is equal to alpha times R0 times delta T. Now, the percent change in radius that would be given by delta R, which is the change, divided by R0 times 100. That's how we calculate a percent change. You take the change in the quantity, delta R, divided by the initial value, R0, and then you multiply by 100. Well, delta R over R0 is just alpha times delta T, right? If we divide out the R0 here, we're just left with alpha times delta t. So that's what we multiply by 100. Okay, so we have alpha 12 times 10 to the minus 6 inverse degree Celsius times delta t, which is 100 degrees Celsius, and then times 100 to make it a percentage. This works out to 0.12%, and it's an increase. So the radius increases by 0.12%. Not that much, but certainly something you can measure. Now, when it comes to the volume, well, of course, we're going to be using volume expansion formulas, which state that delta V is equal to 3 times alpha times V naught times delta T. Now, the percent change in volume, it's defined the same way. It's delta V over V naught um, times 100. But in this case, delta V over V naught would end up being 3 times alpha times delta T. Right? When you divide out V naught, you're just left with 3 times alpha times delta T. And then you multiply by 100. So... We actually don't need to calculate this again, right? Because it's just three times what we found before. Three times 0.12% would be 
0.36%. So the volume increases by an even bigger percentage. Okay, next, let's do density. So for density, we have to remember that rho is equal to m over v. That's the definition of density. Now, if I wanted to percent change in density, what would I be calculating? I'd be calculating delta rho, change in density, over rho naught, starting density, times 100 which would be rho minus rho naught, final minus initial is our delta p, or delta rho, sorry, over rho naught times 100. Okay, so I can write that in a more simplified way as rho over rho naught minus one times 100, okay? So remember, uh, rho divided by rho naught is a ratio of densities, but each density is a mass over a volume. So on top, I'll have m over v, where v is the final volume. On the bottom, I'll have m over v naught, where v naught is the initial volume, and then minus 1 times 100. Now, the mass is canceled because the, the mass doesn't change. We have the same mass before and after. It's just the volume that's changing. So this would be V naught over V minus one times 100. That's how I would get the percent change in density. Okay, so let's work that out. If delta V is equal to three times alpha times V naught times delta T, that means V minus V naught, that's the change, is equal to three times alpha times V naught times delta T, which means V is equal to V naught plus three times alpha times V naught times delta T, or pulling out that V naught factor, V naught times one plus three times alpha times delta T. Okay, so let's actually put that into our formula for the percent change in density. So on top I have V naught. On the bottom I have V, which is the final volume given by V naught times one plus three times alpha times delta T. And then we do minus one and then times 100. Cancel out V naughts like this. Okay. So basically, here's what we have. One over one plus three times alpha times delta T minus one times 100. That's something we can just calculate. So I have one over one plus three times alpha, which is 12 times 10 to the minus six inverse degrees Celsius times delta T, 100 degrees Celsius. Take that, subtract one, and then multiply 100. This will give you negative, it's gonna come out negative, 0.36%. So we have a 36% decrease in the density, all right? All right, so here's a conceptual question for you guys to think about. We know that if a metal disc is heated, its diameter will increase because of thermal expansion, okay? So that, that should be pretty straightforward. But what if instead of a metal disc, we have a metal ring, okay? So there's a hole in the middle of the disc like this. It's a metal ring. Well, if we heat that up, what happens to the size of the hole? Is the hole going to get bigger or is the hole going to get smaller and close up? So what can we say about the inner diameter of this ring? Is it going to increase or decrease? So pause the video, think about this for a second, and then we'll go through it together. Okay, so let's try to figure out what happens here. 
So I'm going to outline a scenario for you where we start with a solid disk like this. And then we draw a dashed line on it. Okay, so we can draw that dashed line over here somewhere. The next thing we'll do is we'll heat the disk up. So we'll increase its temperature. Delta T is going to be something positive. Okay, now what we'll have is a disk that has expanded and every part of the disk has expanded, including that little dashed line we drew. So we'll say the disk and the dashed line both expand. Okay, so let's call this number one before heating and this number two after heating, okay? So for number one, if we cut along the dashed line, then we get a ring. Okay, something like this. And same goes for number two. Cut along the dashed line, you get a ring. But in the case of number two, we get a ring that has a bigger inner diameter than number one. So in other words, D2 is bigger than D1. This is a roundabout way of saying, if you have a ring and you heat it up, it undergoes thermal expansion. And the inner diameter increases. In other words, the inner diameter, i.e. the hole, gets bigger. So that's the answer, the hole gets bigger. So if you weren't convinced by that argument, let me explain it a different way. Let's take a look at the microscopic basis of thermal expansion. What's going on at the microscopic level when an object undergoes thermal expansion? Okay, so the first thing to realize is that when we have a solid object, the atoms that make up that solid are arranged in a lattice like this, where each atom occupies a certain position in that lattice. And the atoms aren't just stationary, they're moving, okay? They're vibrating back and forth in a random way around an equilibrium position. And the higher the temperature, the more energy those randomly vibrating atoms actually have. That's really what temperature is all about. It's about the microscopic energies of these particles. So in other words, if we increase the temperature we increase the amplitude of the oscillations. So at low temperatures, you get small oscillations. At higher temperatures, you get bigger oscillations, okay? And what that effectively does is increases the average distance between the atoms. So you increase the temperature and the atoms wanna get further apart, okay? Because they're oscillating with bigger amplitudes. So if we go back to the idea of the ring, well, at low temperatures, again, the atoms that make up that ring are closer together. When you increase the temperature, when you heat it up, they get further apart, okay? And as a result of that, the hole, the size of the hole in that ring is actually going to increase, right? If the hole gets smaller, that means those atoms are getting closer together. That's not what happens. As you heat it up, they get further apart, the only way for that to make sense is if the hole gets bigger, okay? So that's what's going on on a microscopic level when it comes to thermal expansion. So 
With that said, let's do another example. This one involves thermal expansion of volume. So we have a 70 liter steel gas tank, which is filled to the brim with gasoline at 20 degrees Celsius. The tank sits in the sun and the temperature of the tank and the gasoline both increase to 40 degrees Celsius. So the question is how much gasoline spills out as a result of the thermal expansion. So here's what's going on. The tank is going to undergo thermal expansion because it's made out of steel and the steel will expand, but also the gasoline inside the tank will expand. And in fact, the gasoline will expand even more. So as a result of that, it's going to spill out some of that gasoline. So the coefficients of volume expansion beta, that's that number beta I referred to earlier, for steel and gasoline are 36 times 10, times 10 to the minus 6 inverse degree Celsius for steel and 950 times 10 to the minus 6 inverse degree Celsius for gasoline. So again, much bigger uh, coefficient of expansion for the gasoline. That's why it expands faster than the steel and then it ends up spilling out of the tank. So let's work out exactly how much gasoline spills out of the tank. Okay, so for volume expansion, we have delta V is equal to three times alpha times V naught times delta T, or we can write this in a slightly different way. Delta V is equal to beta times V naught times delta T, where beta, that's our coefficient of volume expansion, is equal to three times alpha, where alpha is our coefficient of linear expansion. So in this case, we're gonna write it um, in this form with the coefficient beta out front, okay? Now, delta V is a change in volume, so that's V minus V naught, final minus initial. That equals beta times V naught times delta T. So the final volume would be V naught plus beta times V naught times delta T, which if we pull out the common factor of V naught gives us V naught times one plus beta times delta T. So here's what we're gonna do. We're basically gonna apply this to the tank and the gasoline to find out the final volume. For both the steel and the gas, the initial volume is 70 liters because the gas is completely filling the tank, which has a volume of 70 liters. But again, after each one expands, they might have different volumes. So let's do the final volume of the gasoline. So let's call this V gas. That's gonna be, again, using this result over here, V naught, which is 70 liters times one plus beta, for gasoline, that's 950, 10 to the minus six inverse degrees Celsius. And then delta T, that's 40 degrees Celsius as our final temperature minus 20 degrees Celsius as our initial temperature. That's what we're calculating. Now, that final volume of the gasoline if you calculate this, is 71.33 liters. So it expands quite a bit, actually. And, uh, oops, we'll keep three sig figs on that. Now, the tank is also going to expand. In other words, the space inside of the tank that's available will get bigger, but not by the same amount because V naught is 70 liters. And then we'll have one plus beta, which is 36, 
10 to the minus 6 inverse degree Celsius. And then once again, times um, delta T, which is 40 minus 20 degrees Celsius. If you calculate that, it only works out to 70.05 liters. So the, the space in the tank got bigger, but the amount of gasoline also got bigger and much, much faster. So some of it's gonna spill out. The volume that spills out is gonna be the volume of gas minus the volume of the tank. So that's gonna be 71.33 liters minus 70.05 liters. And that works out to 1.28 liters. We're gonna keep only the first decimal place there. So about 1.3 liters of gasoline spills out. That's quite a bit. So that's why you don't leave your gas tank filled to the brim, especially not on a hot day, because it's just gonna spill out due to thermal expansion. And so here is a very useful way to utilize thermal expansion in your everyday life. You may know that if you're having a problem opening a jar, it's just stuck on too tight. You can run the lid under hot water. And then after you do that for a while, you heat the lid up, uh, it actually comes off much more easily. Now, the reason for that is typically the jar itself is going to be made out of glass and the metal lid is some type of metal, let's say it's made out of steel, right? Glass has a relatively low coefficient of thermal expansion. The alpha for that is around nine times 10 to the minus six inverse degrees Celsius. A metal is typically gonna have a much larger value. For steel, it's about 12 times 10 to the minus six inverse degrees Celsius. So if you run the jar under hot water like this, the metal expands, and the glass also expands. But the metal expands faster because it has a larger coefficient of thermal expansion. So that means after both the glass and the metal expand, the metal is not gonna be stuck to the glass so closely. It's gonna expand out further than the glass, making it easier to actually loosen the jar and get it open. So that's it for this lecture. Um, that's everything about thermal expansion I wanted to cover. As usual, there are practice problems at the end. We're not going to have time to get to these in the video, but use this for extra practice, especially as you study for the test. So lend it here. I'll see you in the next one. Until then, take care. See you later.